We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Now, tonight, we're deviating from our standard format just a bit, as it's our fifth anniversary. We recorded the first ever episode of our podcast back on July 26th, 2018. That's exactly five years ago today, the day we are recording this. In celebration of that milestone, we're going to be doing a bit of a retrospective, as well as answering some anniversary-worthy questions that we got from some of our biggest fans on our Discord channel. Now, before that, though, I think we have to at least answer a few of the questions that most board game podcast listeners expect to hear during an anniversary episode, like what are some highlights from the last year as far as our content goes? Well, the big one that people uh, can see who are watching this live or are here on our chat or watching on YouTube um, is the fact we have built a new studio in my basement. We uh, finally set up the new PC, which I've been talking about for way too long, and moved our recording space from our upstairs office slash used to be a bedroom into my actual game room. And you can now see the game shelves behind me, at least part of them. And you a can kind of see the window. <laughs> yes, it's a small. Yes, I know. Built a new studio. Sounds so impressive. But it's a more permanent setup. Um, some of the things that's kind of nice is the fact that like this boom arm here for my mic, I can easily push out of the way and back in and I just leave it set up. Um, what you can't really see is I actually have a, a green screen set up over here, which we'll get to in a bit there. Um, we have way more lighting. We have more cameras. We've done quite a bit to upgrade the space and broadcast. Most importantly, especially for unboxing videos is actually broadcast at a higher resolution. And then I actually have a whole new location and office that I'm working out of. So that's been a pretty big change. Now, I did set it up pretty quickly, though, and there are still more optimizations coming out of this location as well. Um, I have new camera. So we now have th I now have three cameras. Um, I'm too zoomed in for you to be able to see it. But there is a camera that I'm looking at. There's actually a camera up here. Um, for doing a top-down view, which will be great if uh, for unboxings or if I'm building anything. And we may also use for actual plays eventually. And I also have one over here to my right that just stays there with a TV tray set under it. Uh, that's where the green screen comes in. I've got a green and blue screen chroma keyed um, mouse pad is what it is, a large mouse pad, so that I can now do close-up shots of our videos without just having to hold things up to the camera and hope they come into focus. And then uh, I've been working on my video editing skills, uh, learning how to do more with our content. Uh, now, some of it is not at all obvious to you viewers out there, and that's kind of the point. Uh, but the workflow on putting out the videos and the podcast itself after we record is 100% different than what I was doing a year ago. Uh, my entire workflow and how the show comes together, how we get it all put together, in order to distribute to you as a mm -hmm. on YouTube or on the audio stream are is in fact completely different now than what we did before. Uh, one of the big ones is we went to a con, like an actual game convention and a pretty big one at that. Um, our first, at least for Dan and our first con experience in four years. And it was awesome. Like I, I, I felt like returning home I loved being at the con. I, Columbus was awesome. Downtown Columbus, getting some of the food, uh, running into a few people, not as many as I'd hope, but people of con friends, as people like to call them. But uh, most importantly for our podcast is concerned is connecting with so many publishers, uh, both a mix of ones we've worked with in the past, some we are currently working with, like the op we kind of hung out with quite a bit, as well as reconnecting with people we worked with a long time ago that we hadn't seen since the previous con season. And even more so, possibly more importantly, is making new connections at the con. It was a fantastic thing for our podcast, like for our brand. Um, we, we're set for reviews for quite some time now. And like stuff we're excited about. It's not like we went in there and said, we'll take anything like like actually genuinely excited to work with these publishers and share share their games with you. Uh, I think it was actually more than probably five years for me since I've attended a con. So that was definitely a big one. Uh, I am not a big crowd people, but you put a camera in my hand and I kind of ignore the people to some degree. So uh, <laughs> that makes it a little easier for me. Uh, it was definitely different uh, than a lot of the cons we've gone to. You know, this 
this was more like uh breakout con for uh was for me where we actually you know were there as media and doing mm-hmm. things unlike going to uh border city con and just hanging out and playing games uh so the other thing is uh we've updated our graphics uh with great thanks to gwen for the graphics on our podcast on our youtube our, our waiting streams all our fancy uh cartoonish i don't mean our cartoon but uh 2d graphics that uh we've got now mm-hmm. that have come up this year are all thanks to mo's daughter uh and the fantastic animations and images that she's used that are you'll see now on our thumbnails as well as throughout the show yeah and that's something i, I hope to integrate more in at some point i'll get rid of the close-up of my face on everything and switch over to the the graphic version it's just a bit of uh having to reset up well except um, uh, some yeah, of the stuff unfortunately people on there is something to be said about people on uh, on your thumbnails, and, and there's definitely a, a bump to that, so it's hard to say. Yeah, maybe it's better how it is. Yeah. What I need to do, this is in the, I'm jumping ahead to some of our future plan. I need just need more headshots, yes. so it's not the same two pictures all the time, where my beard's a little scraggly at that particular time, too. Like, I, I need to, I should take one today. You know, I trimmed everything up today um, with the bellhop shirt on, right, which would definitely be better. But yeah, that, that, that some of those graphics were actually a gift for last year's birthday. Last year, our four-year Gwen provided some of that and has done some additional work, like uh, adding Sean to things, which is pretty awesome. Uh, another really big one, potentially, for us as the Tabletop Hub for the podcast and all of our content is we decided to join Gamma, the Game Manufacturers Association. Uh, no, we don't manufacture games. Gamma started that way. Uh, quickly expanded into the retail space as well as the manufacturer space, um, but now has added, um, as of last year, the year before, a new media and press element of uh, Gamma. So we are now official voting members of Gamma. And that's actually part of what got us to go to Origins, because this year, to go as media, um, they they basically favored Gamma members, which I guess makes sense. It's a Gamma show. Um, not sure I what we're like, um, one of the things we did sign up for, I haven't, it's, it's my own fault. I haven't pursued, um, they were looking for someone to write articles for them and I, I should be pushing that a little harder. I still get their newsletters and I see the things that's going, w- what's coming up. Um, I just not sure where this is going to go. Um, the plan right now is to definitely renew for another year and then attend the Gamma Trade Show. Now, the Gamma Trade Show is one of the the first cons, so that's a big thing, being able to go to Gamma. It's something that, that used to be only publishers and retailers go, and it's a big con for publishers to promote their products to retailers. And I think being there as the fly-on-the-wall media would really cool, be really cool. Um, the other thing is there's a bonus that they're moving it to Louisville, and it happens that Deanna has family in Louisville, so it would be a cheaper trip for us being able to stay with family. So the plan right now is to stick with Gamma next year and go to the Gamma Trade Show, go to Origins, and then we'll take a look if the membership's been worth it. Yeah, I think this could be a great thing for us. Uh, I, I saw media at Gamma Expo this year, um, you know, finally getting getting the, their hands on on things, previews of stuff that uh, we weren't able to see at Origins because it wasn't at Origins mm-hmm. and it's not getting released until later this year. So, uh, you know, it, there's definitely a benefit to us if we can get there. Um, as for the Gamma membership itself, I think Gamma does unfortunately need to step up a little bit and find a little bit more direction. Uh, they yeah. did have spent so long as a retail and, and manufacturers association that the expansion has hit some road bumps uh, they're yep. still finding their legs, and I think they've got time to do that, but they do need to step up and do that. Yeah, this is definitely, it It feels new still. Media and press arm of Gamma is definitely the the new mutation that they're not quite sure what to do with yet. Now, something we did um, somewhat behind the scenes, like the info's out there, people go looking for it, but we did update our about page on the blog. Um, we made a master list of every game we reviewed. Um, not sure if that's 100% up to date, but it's pretty close. Uh, we created and formalized an official review policy. Uh, we made a number of info sheets and PDFs we can send to publishers and potential advertisers 
we set rates for things like advertising. Uh, again, stuff that I don't know if the average listener really cares, but that information is out there. And if you are a publisher who's interested in looking, working with us, now you that information is right there on the web. And just this last week, uh, one thing that is a little bit noticeable, it's not in your face, but it's there. Uh, is that we're we've, trying not to make it in your face. We've started updating our disclosures to fall in line with new regulations and guidance from the FTC. So you may notice us mention affiliate and uh, and publisher. You know, this was provided by uh, publishers for free, etc. A little more often than we used to in the past, and it's going to pop up as a graphic on videos a little more often as well. Yeah, this is going to be definitely noticeable for anyone who uh, consumes our content through video. Uh, you're going to see pop-ups basically saying, hey, this is a review copy, which is something the FTC guidelines have been updated and the, and the rules have changed a bit. Um, they want more disclosure. We think we're, we're, we're all for disclosure. We want people to know we have existing relationships with publishers. Uh, though some of the requirements seem a little ridiculous, like in three years' time, when I share a picture of me playing a game that I got as a review copy three years ago, having to tag that seems like a bit much. But you will start to hear more of that. Um, that's not us trying to be used car salesmen or anything. We're just trying to follow the rules. Yeah, this is to protect everyone because there are a number of bad actors out there, not necessarily in the board game space, but in the influencer space in general, who are being deceptive in their practices. And we yeah. are trying to follow the rules as closely as we can to help the FTC and other organizations fight back against deceptive advertising and review practices. Uh, speaking of affiliates, we've added a bunch of new ones. Um, one of the best places to find a list of these, if you go to our Discord, there is a pinned post in, I think it's in the board game deals section. I should have figured that out before saying this. <laughs> um, there, there is a section where we list as many of the affiliates we have as possible. Now, I did run out of characters, so I probably have to update that. Um, we got Mysterious Package Company, which has been fantastic for us so far. Uh, plus, we have an actual discount code for them, which is Bellhop, all one word. Escape Well, same deal. New affiliate, loving their puzzles, discount code, Bellhop, save 10%. Geekify, which we got to see their stuff in person at Origins. Oh my God, is it amazing? This is a company that, that geekifies stuff. It upgrades stuff. They... They produce like deluxe covers for D&D hardbacks and stuff like that. Really neat stuff. Um, they have maps and like you can get pages from the Necronomicon. Uh, Evil Genius Games, who seems to have gotten the license for every action movie ever made. Uh, this is an RPG company that is doing the latest edition of D20 Modern and release, releasing a bunch of games based on that, like Escape from L.A. and Terminator and Predator. Um, Outsmarted, the, the trivia game we reviewed a couple weeks back, gave us an affiliate as well as a discount code, which if I remember is also Bellhop. We're trying to make it so they're all the same. And if they give us something else, we're like, please change it to Bellhop. Um, Puzzling Pursuits, La Famiglia, and um, what was the other one? Blackbrim uh, were the two puzzles we tried out with them. They also became affiliates, which is, is pretty cool. And again, using these doesn't cost you anything. Um, I don't understand the hate against affiliate links because it's just it's a mutual beneficial relationship between us and a publisher. The publisher sells more games and we get a cut for helping them sell more games. That's all there is to it. It doesn't cost you anything. We get a small kickback on every purchase. Now, huge thanks to everyone that does use our links when shopping for games. That is what lets us keep doing this show. Well, that's all stuff about the show and our other content. But let's talk a bit about games. What is the best new-to-us game that we played this past year? Well, we're all about board games, not just not just selling them and affiliates. Yes. Um, oh, so many good choices, especially when you realize, like, uh, like our year isn't starting January, right? I got to go back to July last year, and there was some awesome stuff we discovered in, like, August. Um, so, so one of the big ones has got to be Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Uh, that was was a, our most played game. I played a ton of that, and mainly trying to review all the expansions. Uh, Thrones of Valeria, which a, a great trick taking game. Point Salad, simple to learn, very accessible. Throw it in Deanna's purse. I uh, chiseled a deck deconstruction game. Shobu, which I am absolutely adoring. I'm sorry, Boop, but Shobu I like better. A pocketbook adventures. Do everyone remember the one month where I was going on about that thing? I loved that game. I, I really am tempted to go 
with Thrones of Valyria. I want to. I love Thrones of Valyria. We taught it just Saturday at the barbershop bar, but there's those clarity issues. And those clarity issues came up again this past weekend. We had people calling me over to the table and say, what's this mean? Is this, what is this number? And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's a gray eight. And we're in a, it's not that dark in that bar, but it's not perfectly well lit. So because of that, I can't give it the top spot. So what I think I'm going to go with is point salad, which ironically I think is funny because it's, we didn't get a review copy. We, we do, we're not working with AEG. Uh, this is one we bought for ourselves while on vacation because we found a good price out in the middle of nowhere in northern Ontario. I just so small and portable, simple to teach, but featuring really engaging gameplay. And I haven't gotten sick of it yet. Uh, for me, I'm going with one. Again, this this isn't a review copy. This is this is something I I paid for uh myself and backed, and that is the DC deck builder Injustice. Uh, because what I really love about the injustice is how well they nailed the pvp version of the game uh it's not the first pvp but it just it really encapsulates that whole um you know player versus player section so well uh both at two i've played it both at two and three and i think it's a little stronger at two but it was still a solid three-player game uh and it really brought a lot of new and interesting dynamics to the dc deck building uh, game that really shocked me. No, nope, totally fair. Now I'm going to call it something from the chat here for those who can't read what Ryan Stevens. So Ryan was just mentioning about affiliates. The, the affiliate suggests that someone's shilling for the products. I, I can see that if we were only affiliates with one company, the fact we have so many different affiliates for different publishers and different things uh, to me, like I'm, I'm chilling for everyone. <laughs> Plus, like we're just talked about two games for companies we don't have relationships with. So I don't think it's a problem for us. Um, uh, so, so I, I think that's it. Um, but and, I guess that could be at least one reason. And and, and again, as the Inchi Games points out in the chat, we are picky. Uh, we don't yep. take every affiliate link that gets offered to us no. or every product <laughs> code. Uh, if you don't fit in with the Bellhop brand, you're not gonna get linked or mentioned nope totally true all right so what uh what do you what's your biggest surprise of last year all right i had to think about this one because there were a lot like like there were quite a few um pocketbook adventures i just mentioned i i kind of want to call out but i think we actually called that one out on the 200th episode just because i'm like i totally wasn't expecting as much fun as i had with that uh the next one i was considering was uh horizon zero dawn because I expected big, overproduced, shiny miniatures. Look how pretty it is. Oh, it's a licensed game where you chuck a bunch of dice. And that's not at all what it is. Well, okay, that's part of what it is. But it's actually really fun and a well-did game. And what really won me over on that one is that Deanna was sold on it by the end. And Deanna is not a cooperative game player. And yes, this is competitive. You, there, you are trying to be first among equals, but there are a lot of cooperative aspects. And Deanna enjoying it was a big thing. But you know what? I, I need to push that one aside, though, because I am still in shock. And another licensed game, so this this fits well with uh, with the theme here, is Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. I, I, I'm shocked by how good that game is and the fact no one else is talking about it. Like, like it is such, it is one of the best deck builders I played. It's one of the better competitive games i played like the way you can in, interfere with each other and move each other around and the way it matters that all the, where the miniatures are and the way they tied in the theme of these bounty hunters kind of working together to take people down but you want to be the person that finally catches the criminal like i just love that game for me and again we are i didn't even realize that we were sticking with a theme here but yes. mine <laughs> is also a licensed product and that's the my little pony deck builder um, I had been laughing about this. I had been making jokes and puns in the background and, and like, oh, great. You know, this is this is fun. And and I knew it wasn't aimed at kids. But what I didn't realize was not only is it not aimed at kids, it's actually a solid deck builder that's bringing new things to the mm -hmm. deck building genre that is introducing some complex mechanics that you don't always see in a deck builder. Yeah. And, and so as a result, I really kind of had to eat crow and and instead of laughing about My Little Pony, admit that, darn, if it wasn't for the graphical problems in this game, 
Uh, this would be a fantastic deck builder game for mm -hmm. anyone, regardless of your love or dislike for My Little Pony. Yeah, totally agree. And maybe it's just because we're old and jaded, but I guess we have a thing against licensed games because we're, we're still traumatized by our childhood. And where we obviously expect, <laughs> I know, but we, we obviously expect them to be garbage. I know it's not true nowadays. There are tons of awesome licensed games out there. Uh, we, uh, Star Wars Imperial Assault is still one of my favorite games, and it's Star Wars. But it's just like the fact that our three, like the games we're mentioning as our biggest surprises are yet again, good license games, I think says something. We we need to move on, I think, from thinking, getting that stuck in our head. Fair enough. Uh, next, I want to do most unique game. What what stuck out as completely, really different? Um, for me, that's Once Upon a Line. Because someone took lottery scratch cards using a tool to scratch off silver crap to reveal something underneath and made that into a story driven board game with fantastic art and what seemed to be an engaging story. Now we only got to try a prototype of this and uh, we only got to play like the intro. So we didn't get a real deep dive in this, but the fact someone gamified scratch tickets, it, it blows me away. Like, like I'm always looking for something new and I, usually it's a new theme that comes out or maybe a slight twist on a mechanic. This was something I've never seen before. Like, this just blew me away in the, wow, there is thinking outside of the box. And for me, we haven't actually reviewed this yet, but we have talked about it, and that is Reality Shift Deluxe. This has, game has done so much with geometry and reimagining mm -hmm. of the board game into three dimensions. Um, the, the way this game makes you think about the space of, of game uh is is to me at least as uh inventive and interesting as you know turning something like a scratch ticket into a board game mm -hmm. they've really kind of thought uh outside the box despite the fact that they are in fact using boxes all right next i want to highlight my favorite review favorite review we did um there's two though i i i have to cheat a bit here um number one this is where i put horizon zero dawn because like I, I had fun the first time we played it with Kat and Tori, and I was shocked by how they managed to catch the feel of Horizon Zero Dawn without making it the video game. You're not Aloy, you're not exploring cauldrons, you're not uniting tribes. It focuses on one small part of the game world and does it well so you get that feel of that one part of the game. And that blew me away. That part was awesome. The other thing, though, was in particular a Sean Con, a, a, a three day gaming weekend where Sean was over and Deanna, Sean and I played through an entire hunt in one weekend. Now, a hunt in that game is five encounters, each of which can take two hours. So you're looking at like a 12 hour game experience or, or, or 16. I don't even know how many hours we spent. And the way the enjoyment of that game evolved from that first hunt and looking for stuff in the rule book and trying to figure out some of the weird idiosyncrasies of the game and completely forgetting that every time you dodge, you have to move your figure to the last couple of battles where we were actually like in character. We each had our own playing styles. Our characters had evolved to be completely different. Sean and Deanna hated me because I kept stealing their kills and we had a ton of fun in a game with a lot of issues. And I think that all came out really well in that particular final review. But just the format of the review, what, what the words we chose to use, how we talked about it. Now, part two, the second game that, that, that I have to give like an honorable mention to, I guess, would be Scythe. The game I hated that I grew to love. And the shifting, my shifting opinion on the game as I played it with more people and gained system mastery over it. Scythe also is our most popular review on the blog. It gets more hits than anything else. And I don't know if that's because people are curious about Scythe or that people are enjoying my journey with that particular game. And I think that one shows more of my changing experience with the game than any of the other reviews we've done. So for me, uh, it's going to be Cowboy Bebop. Uh, again, it's a game that hardly anyone knows about but is such a solid deck builder with unique 
aspects with the player control and the, the mm -hmm. location movement. It was just a delight to play and to experience as a game, as well as, you know, through the review, sharing it with others who probably haven't heard of it because for some reason, nobody's heard of it. Uh, and yep. so for favorite review, I think I have to pick Bebop again because I want to share this game to other people. Other people need to know about this game. All right. I know in general, we try to keep things positive. Now, we don't edit our reviews. We don't choose what to review based on. We don't only do positive reviews. We're not the kind of people who won't say anything negative about a game. But we do vet the games before we even agree to review them. And that is a change since year one. Um, or even more so when I used to do the Windsor Gaming Resource and posted reviews on my own before we had a podcast. I basically was like, hey, I got free games. This is cool. I'll review anything. Um, that has shifted. I, we get offers to review games probably daily anymore. And I turn down way more than I accept. So I do research before actually getting a game to review. So in general, we're talking about games we're excited about that we wanted to play and that we thought we'd enjoy. But sometimes that doesn't quite work out. And sometimes the games aren't quite what we expect. I'm going to pass this one to Sean first. We switch things up a bit. But what would you say was your biggest disappointment this year, game-wise? You know what? I have to say, and this is interesting because you actually, you actually already mentioned this, but I'm going to say once upon a line. So while I will give them props for trying something new and interesting, um, and congratulations to them. They funded on Kickstarter. More power to them. Uh, this game just did not do it for me. Um, I think it probably would have made a fun mobile app, uh, but yeah. between the effort and the mess and the the way, the you know, yes, it's a multiplayer game, but you still have to have one person sitting there scraping things off and everyone else looking over their shoulders. It just didn't do it for me. And uh, I, I just didn't feel like it cut it as a physical uh, game. And uh, I think, you know, some of the some of the problems that their Kickstarter is having with shipping may be indica ind indicative of that same sort of problem. I'll admit I have not looked back at this one since we did the review uh, preview, I should say. Um, I, I have no idea how the Kickstarter is doing. I did watch it enough to find out it funded. I did consider backing it because I did enjoy the the experience of this game. I, I was impressed by a couple aspects of it, like the, the way they tied in hints in the story to what you were looking for. Um. I really want to see the final reviews. I, I want to see what other people have to say about this game. I, 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 it may have just been a gimmick. And I totally get Sean. What, the reason Sean didn't enjoy it, I fully understand. And I don't necessarily disagree with. Now, for me, it's Hunt a Killer Mystery at the Hunter's Lodge. It's a, based on an Agatha Christie book. Um, you're probably going, why? Well, I don't remember, like, unless you happen to catch the right episode where we talked about this in the Ask the Bellhops sorry, the Bellhops tabletop segment, you're probably like, whoa, I don't remember a review on that. Well, that's because we haven't. And there's a reason for that. So this is probably the most, I think it's definitely the most expensive game in my collection as a single purchase. Like uh, we have probably spent more money on Imperial Assault if I added in all the expansions. And if I take Gloomhaven plus the box insert plus, you know, uh, Jaws of the Lion, we might be getting up to the same price, but this is a very expensive, very high-end board gaming product that is an actual wooden chest that you open up that has physical artifacts in it that include things like a drinking flask, uh, a working watch, a banner, a house banner and everything, and it's a murder mystery. You are trying to find out what happened at the Hunter's Lodge, and it looked amazing, and we got this mainly from my mother-in-law, who is a big Agatha Christie fan and Deanna who loves this style of game. I like puzzle escape room in a boxes. I like the, the, the solve the puzzle, I, whatever here, use the cipher, get these clues, fold the paper the right way, assemble the thing and look up to the light, that kind of thing, right? The escape room boxes, the, the 3d puzzle boxes. Deanna likes the murder mysteries. Here's a bunch of facts. Here's a bunch of clues. You're going to use the itinerary to figure out what time the person was at the place. And like, that's what she likes. We were so hyped for this game. Plus, Hunter Killer hooked us up with an affiliate program. So we're like, hey, this is great. We have this rather expensive high end game that looks fantastic that we'll get to talk about that'll probably work out well for us. Then we sat down to play 
And we were having a great time for, it might have been two, three hours. And then we got so completely and utterly stuck. We're like, what is wrong? Like, like there is no way for us to progress from here. So we then started digging into it. And one of the things that comes in the box, and this is a recommendation for anyone doing these kinds of games. If the game gives you an inventory and checklist, check it. An entire book was missing from our copy of the game. Fine. Mistakes happen. I contacted them and I asked for a replacement book. When I get that replacement book, we'll finally publish our review because it still hasn't shown up. They still have done nothing to help us out other than to send me a PDF. And I'm sorry, I am not going to print off a PDF for a very expensive wooden game box that part of the whole thing is the physical artifacts. S give me the actual manual that's missing that I can hold in my hands and touch, not a couple sheets of paper I print off my printer. So uh, sorry, hunt a killer. Um, to make it even worse, they canceled their affiliate program. So even if we were talking about it, we don't even get like that small part of it out of that. So yeah, biggest disappointment. Deanna's biggest disappointment as well. She's agreeing in the chat room is uh, Hunt a Killer's Mystery at Hunter's Lodge and uh, their lack of support, customer support. Yeah, like absolutely. I All right. Well, another part of birthdays besides looking back is looking ahead. So we look towards the future. So one of the ones that I thought was interesting when I was going through our reviews and, and things that we published this year is that we did way more previews and prototypes and reviewer copies and early releases than any previous year. And this is even after saying we're no longer doing Kickstarters from independent companies that keep shipping us in, 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 uh, incomplete games that we end up having to play test instead of review. No, these are like near finished products. And I'm wondering, again, I'm going to let Sean go first on this one, is um, if there's one in particular, now that we've done the preview, we've done we, the, the Kickstarters live, we, we've showed off the, the prototype. Is there something you are waiting for the final version? What are you most excited to see come to fruition? I'm actually really interested in seeing uh, for or, and, and rooting for Maxime to get Hellbringer out to their backers. Uh, you know, that finally funded. They had a rough, rough period the first time they attempted it. Yeah. They stepped back, made some readjustments, you know, made some new decisions and came out strong again this year in March and had a successful Kickstarter for a game that I think really did some fun and interesting things. And uh, more power to Maxime and, the, and his company for uh, what's coming with Hellbringer. Now, for me, it's going to be Castellans of Valeria. That game was really solid uh and, and it, uh, folk on a map area majority game but instead of units you're building buildings with some neat die mechanics fantastic components which look even better based on the kickstarter i am really looking forward to castle of larry and seeing the final project product product I think it's going to be very similar to when we did the preview of shadow kingdoms of larry and the final product came and it was very similar to what we got to try out but i do know there are going to be some some uh, improvements. So I'm looking forward to that. And I am still really curious what's going to happen with Martin Wallace's fighting fantasy adventures. Like I said, I'm, I'm sold on this one. The, the old school RPG fighting fantasy novel board game. I, I want to see how this will do. The castle of LA is number one for, I, I, I'm, I'm cheating every time here thrown in two, I guess. <laughs> um, it, but I want to know how fighting fantasy adventures will do. Like, I have no idea. It, it was not doing well on Kickstarter. They made so a big we'll see change. how it does. Yeah, they, they, they made some big changes on, uh, when they went to GameFound, though. So as long as they get their marketing uh, ducks in a row, I think they could really hit it out of the park at GameFound. Yeah, we'll see if that takes off. Now, similar uh, question. We brought home a ton of stuff from Origins. We did still have some stuff on the pile of obligation before that, and new stuff still showing up. So of everything we've yet to review... I, I want to hear the chat room answer this one as well, actually. I want to know what the chat wants us to review next. Maybe maybe we can rearrange the schedule a bit. But first off, I want Sean's opinion on what are you most excited to get to the table and get a review out there on? Yeah, so this is a tough one because we brought back so much. Uh, it's hard to keep it all straight in my head. I wasn't even there for some of the review copies. Yeah. We got. I was out, out wandering, so I didn't even necessarily get the preview 
before the box got into uh, into our hands. Um, you have the spreadsheet. I have to remember. Uh, <laughs> but I think the big no, the, no real surprise that the two that I am most looking forward to are Kapow or the Sentinels of Earth Prime. Uh, you know, stick with the supers. Yeah, one you're probably forgetting is Marvel Dice Throne. You probably want that oh, wow. one in there yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that. I, 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 what I want to out of those three, if if we were going to play one this weekend, what would you most like to play? I'm interested in Kapow the most because I think Dice Throne and Sentinels, I've got some idea of what they are and what they'll do. Right. Kapow, I don't. Uh, and Kapow, okay. I'm really interested in seeing what it brings to the genre. Sounds good. Uh, this one's hard for me too. Um, I, to be fair, I'm still like Origins. I'm still hyped. I'm hyped about all those games, which is awesome. And I hope that doesn't fade. Uh, there are so many I want to try. Now, at this point, though, because of the hype, I've already played a bunch of them. Um, like we, we I played multiple games, the show, Boop, Boop, uh, Star Frontiers. I am adoring Star Frontiers. Um, uh, oh, what is it called? Star, not Star Frontiers. That's the wrong name. Star Realms. Star Realms Frontiers. There, that's, I'm, I'm like, it's Star Frontiers something. No, Star Realms Frontiers. Um, that is a great version of Star Realms. Uh, Elector Counts we played. Reality Shift we played. Birds of a Feather. Um, probably a few more I'm forgetting. Um, as far as reviews, I am ready on a bunch of them. Uh, ready to review. Uh, I could review Shobu right now on the show. I could review Boop. Um, Reality Shift I could probably cover, but not the deluxe stuff. Birds of a Feather. Um, so in a way, in my head, those are done. What I most want to play, though, is Distilled. Out of all the games we brought home, that seemed like the game that Deanna and I would enjoy the most. Um, second, possibly being Marrakesh from Queen. But Marrakesh scares me, whereas Distilled, I feel ready to play. Um, Kapow is up there. I, I, that just looked quick and fun and light and I, and supers and using dice. It's, 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 it's super powered Yahtzee. And that seems really cool. And I think that one I, I is going to be great and a big hit at our local events. And then starship captains. I, I, it's CGE. I love CGs. I don't think they publish a bad game. I honestly, I love CG and though we're not affiliates to go back to what we were talking about earlier. I just love CGE stuff. Um, I, I really want to try that one. I, as I think part of it is we're watching a lot of Star Trek right now. So Starship Captains is up there. Uh, but, but most of all distilled and Seas of Havoc. We actually got it out on the table <laughs> the other day and started going through it. And, and, um, a naval war battle with deck building. Just, it, it's, I used to love the old Warhammer game, um, Man of War. But I never got into like most of the naval games were too complex, like the ones my dad enjoyed, which is too much for me. And and this looks like a nice balance between, you know, silly dice chucker to complex strategy game. And I'm really looking forward to that. one. So, yes, it's like every game we wrap back to Origins is what I want to do next. <laughs> um, moving on. What about the show? We talked about games we want to play. What are we going to do to make the show better? Because constant improvement is uh, something that I want. Um, I We want to keep making things slowly better. So one of the things, hopefully no one in the chat noticed, uh, unless we somehow look better, um, is we are no longer using Zoom. I'm sorry, Zoom, you are way too expensive. This cuts a big uh, expense out of our, our 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 podcasting. We are now using Microsoft Teams, uh, which we expect to be a permanent change. Now, we have noticed one problem. For anyone who's been watching our shows, especially since I moved down to the new studio, I've been able to do it without headphones while the headphones are back. So if anyone knows a way to do noise canceling or whatever um, in teams, we would love to hear it, but we haven't figured that out yet. And I would prefer not to be wearing these again. That's the only, so far, the only problem I've seen with teams. Uh, so for me, um, I'm looking at a few, a number of technical shifts around on my end. Um, every time we make a change elsewhere, I, things need to be updated on OBS. And because most of the, uh, one of them happened today, I didn't get all the, the changes in. So there's a couple little tweaks I do. But I'm actually looking at uh, almost redesigning the the look of our uh, show. The show, all the pieces will stay the same, but the technical layers that we go through 
to uh, to do it um, makes things a little more difficult uh, than they need right. to be. Uh, like we actually have a, a, a the, the line down the middle of our screen here. There's actually a black line in graphics that's there. Mm -hmm. So if we want to go full screen right now, we have a black line there. Uh, and I'm looking at ways of trying to get rid of of stuff like that so that we have more flexibility. Um, and then we're going to sort of experiment with some new new styles um, that may, you know, maybe we'll go ran go live randomly some night or uh, <laughs> try some brunch yes. shows to, to test things out so that we aren't just experimenting live for our podcast, which kind of matters to us. You know, this is the, the bread yeah. and butter. Um, so we may experiment other ways, um, but you'll see some changes coming uh, into and hopefully some of them you won't see, but some of them yeah. you will as well. Now, one of the big things I want to change is a new setup for anything I record here. Now, again, this is um, software based. Uh, the hardware, like I said, we now have three cameras, right? Um, so we want to try to change things up so that we can use the three camera setup feeding three different feeds. As it is now, specifically for the podcast, I am sending Sean one image off the one one uh, camera. Well, it'd be nice if I could, you know, show a close up of something now and then or whatever in the middle of our review, I can hold up a card or something like that. So that's one thing. The other thing is for our, the stuff I record here, just myself, the, the stuff that's not done over teams or zoom, uh, like our unboxings and uh, hopefully getting back into actual plays is that being able to send Sean all three cameras as three different feeds or save them as three different video files so that we can do some actual post work on it, some post production work on them. Now, what this will probably mean, though, is less live streams. It'll probably mean we need to start recording stuff, just recording stuff and then putting out a video eventually, which, to be fair, uh, we don't get a lot of views on things like our unboxing videos. Um, the, the, the podcast probably will always stay this way because we love interacting with the chat. I don't want to lose that. But like when we only get two people joining in for an unboxing and one of them, Sean, I don't think we're losing anything by just doing those not live. Right. And now there may actually be options that we can keep it live, but we aren't ruling out the option of stepping back because really right. what we're gaining here is the freedom for me to re remix essentially the content that Mo records, which can lead to tighter, more punchy content, which is better content for us to be discovered by to share out there in the world. Uh, you know, it's fantastic uh, to have people popping in and, and, and catching us on Twitch, but if we can get a video that, you know, triggers something in the algorithm or gets shared or is just mm -hmm. more enjoyed by people on YouTube, that growth potential is really something we haven't managed to hook yet with anything other mm -hmm. than the, you know, one uh, <laughs> FAQ read for, uh, for Gloomhaven. Uh, which isn't going to get any much, isn't going to be doing anything anymore because now no. we're coming out with two, with the second end. So really, we want to we want to come up with tighter, uh, you know, YouTube content uh, yeah. for for that better, higher production value. Uh, next one, Gamma. I mentioned this earlier, but I, I was kind of jumping ahead. We have full plans to attend the Gamma trade show for the first time. Um, this is going to be only the second year that media and events arm of Gamma exists and is invited to the show. And and Gamma is kind of the unofficial start to con season, um, especially for new release part of con season. This will be one of the few times we really should be all about the new hotness. Plus, this will be a great way to make connections before Origins, something that we learned quickly on... Um, at, at origins was people saying, you know, if we agree to it and we're good, I can bring a copy to Gen Con. Well, I want to be able to do that at Gamma for origins. So we can go try the game and say, Hey, this looks great. We want to check this out. We want to, we, we would love to review this. Can you, can we pick up a copy at origins is, is what I would like to be able to do. Plus get that first look. And then Speaking of Gen Con, it sure seems like we should go. Um, I, I swear every publisher we talked to was like, you're going to be at Gen Con, right? We can get you a copy of Gen Con. We could do this at Gen Con. Hey, at Gen Con, why don't we do an interview? Like, like everyone was like, you should be at Gen Con. And we're shocked that we weren't going. 
So we might head to Gen Con. Might very much might. This is, this is of all the, the the potentials. This is probably the 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 one that's biggest in the air. Um, that takes more time off. Uh, it's expensive. You need to find hotel space. It's also totally new to us. So Gen Con is a a small possibility. Yeah, and I definitely need to evaluate uh, the variety of con options. Um, as well as, you know, the expenses and, and time, I'm actually fully employed the rest right. of the time. So I need to think about vacation time as well. Um, so, yes, it, I mean, it, not to say that Mo and D don't, aren't essentially taking vacation because they are no longer working when they're at a con. Oh, we're uh, definitely working well, when we're at the you're, con. You're not working on your, on the affiliates and the, the Amazon yes. and all the, the things that you do in your home office. Uh, yes. Neither am I. And I have an employer who who may not like that as much as, as you two who being your own employers. Yes. So uh we'll, we're gonna I have to I have to see what's going on with that before I, I I decide where I'm going. Yeah, and we're also looking at some other Canadian cons, like day trip style cons or maybe overnight cons instead of bigger ones. That's something I'd like to do more of, but we'll see. That 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 is so up in the air I don't even want to announce ones we're considering going to at this point. All right. I, I could already use more coffee um, and we need to get to some questions from the fans. We've been talking a lot already, um, but before we do, I think it is finally time to announce our latest giveaway. So as this is our fifth birthday, we wanted this giveaway to be both about us and our fans. So we decided to do top games and merch giveaway. So let's start with the top games part of things. Since it's our fifth birthday, we figured we would pick five of our top games from the past year. Games we just talked about earlier. One winner will get a chance to pick one of these five games. Your options are our best new to me games of the year, Point Salad or DC Comics deck building game Injustice. Our biggest surprises of the year. My Little Pony, Adventures in Equestria, or Cowboy Bebop, Space Serenade. Or the game we played the most together in the past year, which is Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Now that's the big prize based on us and the games we played. We're also going to have two consolation prizes, prizes? Prizes. Consolation prizes based on something the fans have been asking for for years now. Pretty much as soon as we started. We've actually got some bellhop merch. That's right. Here's your chance to win an exclusive, probably never to be produced again, tabletop bellhop gaming podcast coffee mug. The nice big ones you see us drinking from on the show. And no, we're not sending you our mugs. That would be gross. We've ordered two new mugs that we will be shipping out to two winners. So top prize choice of five games. Pick one. The games we played this year. And two consolation prizes of bellhop mugs. Enter through the pinned post over at tabletopbellhop.com, which will go live at the end of the show. Now, this time around, sticking where we with the usual um follow us on social media, visit our Instagram page, visit the webpage kind of thing. Uh, we're also going to be asking for some feedback, which can we can hopefully use to make the show even better in the coming year. So not only is this a way to win a game or some merch, it's a way to have your voice heard and impact the future of the show. Now, we will, of course, have bonus entries for our hotel guest Patreon patrons. Watch your inbox in the next couple of days. And so we got a question here from Jeff. You don't even need your notes up for a little while, actually. So uh, right. we, we got a question from Jeff in the Discord. Jeff Seuss asks, I would love to hear stuff about how the podcast, YouTube, blog, and such have grown over five okay. years and any behind the scenes stories that haven't really been told yet. Uh, you know, maybe even things you wish you would have done differently when you first started. Ooh, that's a big one. That, that That's like an all night. We're done. Let's, <laughs> let's just talk about Jeff's question all night. Uh, note, I have not prepared at all for these questions. Um, I haven't even read them all in the show notes. Deanna kept that. He's like, what did you put in from the discord? And I'm like, I am busy doing other stuff. <laughs> um, fair warning. Uh, there is a chance I won't be live any second. The storm is back and, and very loud outside. So just, just a, a fair warning if power goes out. I do not yet have a UPS downstairs here. So 
if, if power goes out, we're out. Yeah, my, so, my computers warning. will stay up. Unfortunately, the internet connection probably won't. So yeah, yeah. So so we'll see. I I, I was sitting here and I'm like, what is that sound? And I'm like, oh, I know what that sound is. All right. Um, I, there's so many parts of that question. All right, so I'm gonna have to bring grown? it up. What, uh, you know how how have we grown? I, I, well, uh, as of today, and I think this is pretty cool. Happy birthday to us. We hit 500 followers here on Twitch, which I know compared to big time streamers is nothing. <laughs> but for us, 500 people follow this show. I think that's pretty cool. 500 people in five years. We can get we can get to 600 by next year. I'll be happy. Absolutely. Uh, YouTube. Uh, the, I, I don't know. YouTube was weird. I, I, YouTube I, makes me wonder if they play with things. So YouTube, the first hundred was really hard. Then like the next 500 were so, so. And when we hit about, what was it? Like 300. I'm, I'm trying to think of what it was. There was like a specific number. All of a sudden we were getting 10, 20 subs a day and it got us to a thousand. Now a thousand subs on YouTube is when you can start to monetize. It's also when you can get your, um, your own name like I, whatever you call that, a vanity URL, and you can set up your channel. And well, YouTube, of course, wants you to monetize. And it sure seemed like it was a 600, but like it, it literally, like we hit this benchmark. I don't, I, I'm going to say 600. And then it just like flew. Like it, in two days, we got more subscribers than we had in two years. And suddenly we were partners. And I'm like, I swear YouTube does some fun, funky stuff there. Like I, that they, they, they did some wonkiness to get us up to that level. And then once we hit 1050 dead, like, like stopped. Um, and very, very steadily have grown since then. Yeah, we, can, which, we do keep going up every once in a while. There's some people drop off some people get added on, but we have kept growing. We're 1500 ish or so now. I don't know the exact number, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we've never seen the kind of growth we had during that one specific, period of time um there are only a thousand tabletop gamers in the entire world yeah uh so yeah that's great and then our we've had so many ups and downs with the audio podcast side uh unfortunately mm -hmm. audio podcasts have been in a decline universally of late yeah um with advertisers dropping out and you know everyone and their brother deciding to make a podcast and glutting the market and you know any number of things and we've had some some huge hits and we've had some huge misses we've had some bizarre things like pandora randomly featuring one of our episodes yeah. that blew the numbers uh just completely off the doors um and so that's that's been interesting um but really most more mostly the uh the audio podcast has basically just been slow and steady fans and we appreciate yep. every one of you who listens to the show wherever you listen to it yeah yeah i think there hasn't been except for that weird youtube blip and then we did we did suddenly the the podcast suddenly started getting more downloads but i don't think that's a true stat in the fact I think we were already getting that, but it's just that what we were used to track it suddenly was tracking more places and, and getting more information. It was like, oh, OK, our numbers are 10 times better than we thought. That's kind of cool. Um, another thing, too, is the work from home movement, right? There's there's a lot of people um, who work from home and commutes have changed. And yeah. that's where a lot of people listen to podcasts. And I'll fully admit it. Uh, I don't listen to podcasts the way I used to. Cause I don't drive anywhere. Like it just doesn't happen anymore. Like I, if I'm driving across town, it's a 15 minute drive and I don't, I, I'm not commuting to work. I'm not taking easy row every day. So I've kind of stopped listening to podcasts. So I can't blame other people for stopping if even I don't do it. Yeah, no fair. Definitely fair. Uh, if I wasn't driving uh, to Hamilton regularly, I would, my list would be shorter. Although I have started lately when I'm preparing dinner, um, there you I've, go. I've been doing, doing some podcast listening, even if I only get, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour in, as I'm preparing and eating dinner, uh, I've been trying to get a little bit more regular in that sort mm -hmm. of podcast listening, because at one point my backup because of the pandemic and the lack of traveling, my backup of podcast lists had gotten ridiculous. Well, yeah, mine used <laughs> to be the, the, the big thing that happened to me is my iPod touch finally died. 
that is where I listened to podcasts was on my iPod touch and it finally died. The one I, I don't even know if it was a year ago. I showed off on the screen with how broken the thing was, but it was still working. Uh, it died and I have to find it. I still haven't found a pod catcher I enjoy. So that should be, I should just do it on Spotify because I mostly work on my PC where I could have Spotify open pretty much all the time, but I need to do it and I don't do it right now. Um, blog, blog, steady, steady increase. Um, we get spikes mainly from deals, right? Prime day was a big spike for us because, uh, the tabletop L hop isn't just this podcast. It's not just our YouTube channel. It's also part of, uh, part of our concierge being your cardboard concierge is carrying board game deals through, um, tabletop gaming deals. And that tends to get us a big spike. The thing is, people stick around. We get a big spike. People go there to look for the deals. And they're like, oh, this guy reviews stuff. Oh, they've got a podcast. Oh, look, they do unboxings. Oh, look, here's an article on RPG map making software. And we get new fans that way. And the blog has increased every year at, at a pretty steady curve. Like a, there's no real, oh, we've made it moment. But I, it has been pretty awesome. To, to slowly see it increase and slowly increase every year. So um, what about uh, things you wish you would have done differently when you first started? Anything uh, you can think of? I don't know. I, I'm, I don't know. I, I kind of wish our video quality was better the whole time. Like, like I feel like the big thing we missed out on was the well-produced video when YouTube was still talking heads. We started as talking heads. We stayed talking heads, whereas everyone else started becoming commercials almost like 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 production quality. Now, I never expected to get there, but I kind of feel like we we missed the boat on being that type of content creator that now there's so many of them that I don't know if it would make a difference if we suddenly started doing it now because there are already so many established, super well produced um, and teaching. Like game teaching is something I feel I'm pretty good at, but we never did video of it because at the time there were already some people that were great at it. Now there are so many people doing teaching videos and it just, I guess it's a bit of jealousy or whatever, but I look at their numbers and I look at our numbers. And I'm like, man, maybe instead of reviewing games, we should be teaching games. Uh, for me, it's mostly uh, just sort of some technical stuff. There's, there's things I wish, uh, you know, could have, I could have set up differently. I would have understood and known differently. Uh, ways to set up the 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 transitions and things on the on, yep. on the stream things that would have made it easier to to do you know youtube and stream content a little a little separately than we do right now um but i mean content wise it's it's all sort of been most dri most driven that uh pretty much the whole thing so i mean when it comes to that uh i'm i'm just along for the uh the ride <laughs> in some ways yeah in a way i don't know i, I don't know it's I, I i've never been a big look back, regret, wish I'd done things differently kind of person. Like it's just not part of my nature. I, I'm more worried about what we can do better tomorrow than what we did wrong five years ago. Fair enough. All right. Well, uh, I do have another question from Jeff, but I'll let somebody else get their voice in first. Uh, Rickman 33 from the uh, discord says, how have your gaming preferences or habits changed? Um, and I, well, there's two parts to it. So first off, how have your gaming okay. preferences or habit, habits changed? Well, the big thing is uh, that we have a podcast, right? And we do a show and we're the tabletop bellhop and we need to constantly be playing games to be able to talk about games. And we started working with publishers and reviewing games for publishers, which have a time limit on them. And my entire gaming life pretty much now it revolves around that. So as opposed to, hey, I have a group come over Monday nights and we play RPGs and I have another group come over Friday nights and we play board games and I host an event every Saturday somewhere in Windsor where I just play more games. And my decision on what to bring is what do I feel like playing now has completely shifted to what do we need to review? What do we need to get in more plays of? What do I need to try at a different player count? What do I need to try with a different group of gamers? What's the next, uh, when's the Kickstarter going to end? Um, I, it's, it's a business now. It's, it's, I, I have lots of, we have a pile of obligation. It's no longer, no longer the, I'm going to play the games I love that I, I love and I want to play again to what do we have to play next? And sometimes that sucks. Other times I don't mind at all. Like it's, we're back from origins. There's so much of that stuff I'm hyped to play 
But then I look at the pile of obligation and now and then there's stuff that like I was excited about when we got it. And it's not that I don't want to play the games, but there's other stuff I want to play so much more. And and much to Deanna's chagrin, we don't get a lot of plays of games we love. Like I'm, I sit in my game room now. I can look around and go, man, I, I would love to say Sean's never played Caverna. It, it's a farming game, but you're also dwarves who explore a mine. And the deeper you dive and you can level up. I'm like, Sean would love that game probably as, as he's learned that he likes heavier games more the more we play them. Weather Machine, we barely gave a chance. Like Sean got us that for Christmas. We should be playing that together just as a group. And you hear we're not. Instead, we're playing what's behind me right now. Oh, no, this is stuff we really like. So <laughs> <laughs> instead, I, I don't want to cut up a game. I don't want to say something we didn't enjoy. And uh, Deanna brought up Destinies. We were on vacation and we picked up Destinies and I read the rules. That's it. So, like, I I, I feel that that my gaming has changed because it had to. And and it's not like we're new, the new hotness. We're not one of those podcasts that we're always constantly playing the new thing. But we still have obligations. Like, I, I part of me misses. I just reviewed games I bought because they were cool. But I can't afford that now. I no longer work at the auto industry making a extremely good salary for what I did and only working 40 hours a week. Like, it's just to, to be able to keep doing this, I have to. I don't even know if you heard that, but that was flipping <laughs> loud. Um, My phone hasn't gone off, so I have to assume it's safe to keep recording. <laughs> I, 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 the, the gods are upset at, at, at me talking about review games. But yeah, that's the, the big shit. This became a job. Like, like literally. Yeah. <laughs> see snail runs. It's like, holy crap. Oh, see Deanna's getting alerts on her phone. All right. We are going to pause just for one second to make sure we don't have to like go get the kids up and bring them downstairs here. Yeah. I can hear it. I can hear it outside my, um, I am not seeing any take shelter notifications. Yeah. I haven't yes. Gotten... Our birthday, we get potential tornadoes in Windsor. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, climate change. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything serious. Definitely nasty. So yeah, I mean, I for me, I mean, my 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 board gaming has changed completely, a hundred a hundred percent. I only ever played games with my family and kids, and every once in a while, I'd get together with Mo and play some cool new game that he was really excited about. Um, whereas now we're playing games that we have to play. Uh, and yeah. in many cases, that's fantastic. I'm, I've loved discovering Sorcerer's Arena and all the different deck builders out there. You know, deck builder was a game. It was something I had no idea of. I didn't understand what a deck builder was. Um, and and now I adore them and and know that it's it's really kind of one of my favorite mechanics. Um, but I don't get to play deck builders all the time because we don't always have deck builders to review. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, how we have to, you know, turn down a lot of things, but there are also some things where we probably should have turned them down and didn't, um, yeah. you know, uh, this, and this is going to allow me to pivot into that next portion of Rickman's question, which is what things have changed in the board game industry. And one of the biggest things is the shift from centralized publishers, you know, a dozen, two dozen major publishers putting out all the games to mm -hmm. anyone and their brother can put out a game. Thank you, Kickstarter, for democratizing yeah. the industry, but also curse you, Kickstarter, for allowing anyone and their brother to put out a game <laughs> regardless of quality. Yeah, that, I would say the biggest change in the industry and in, in the last five years specifically is crowdfunding. And, and in some ways, it's fantastic. It, it, it is it is letting people live their dreams. But there's a reason we no longer do Kickstarter previews, except from established companies who are sending us pretty much complete games. Um, the, the, the quality isn't always there. And we are reviewers, not prototype. Play, we're not playtesters. Well, to be fair, we are. I have playtested games. So has Sean. Um, I've worked with a number of different companies doing playtesting, but that's not <laughs> what we're being asked to do when we get some of these games. So yeah, crowdfunding has changed everything. Like, like it is, it is allowed certain companies like cool mini or not, which was a website I have been a member of since 1990 something where it used to be, here's a picture of a painted miniature and there's the dots at the top where you click one through 10 
based on a older website called hot or not, which some of you may remember um, to one of the biggest board game publishers in the world that wouldn't have happened without crowdfunding without Kickstarter specifically. And now it's not just Kickstarter the, and, and, and like itch and drive through RPG as a place to sell PDFs. Like, yes, drive through has been around longer than us, but just the growth of in Lulu to print books and, the amount of tools out there for someone to publish their own thing now is ridiculous. Literally, pretty much anyone can publish a game. Yeah, and I mean, as just, long with as the recent, have... just the recent developments of GameFound opening up and BackerKit becoming their own Kickstarter mm -hmm. equivalent, um, it has just been fantastic. Um, it's just come, you know, come out of nowhere. But at the same time, I would really love to uh sit around and and do a a a uh, panel at a con explaining to people who want to just kickstart their game how they should be playtesting their game and more specifically their manuals yeah. because i mm -hmm. am sick to death of getting some of the rule books that we get from or we got because yeah. again we're not doing as many of these now but from Kickstarters, Kickstarter previews for people who have just not figured out how to make a rule book that someone can use. There, there is, there is, you have to get past the ego and you have to let your game go. Those seem to be the two big things. People not taking criticism well or taking playtesting advice as actual advice. And people who only play the games with their group while they're there to teach people. And they say they blind play tested, but they blind play tested at a con where they were at the table and fix things like, like you're there to go. No, no, not like that. Like this. Oh, that's what that means. Right, right there. You ruin your play test. Your, your, your blind play test. It's no longer a blind play test. It's, it's a huge issue with newer games. And I'm not even wanted like to get into the the overproduce too many miniatures, blah blah blah. A lot of people like to complain about that. You know what? It works. Yeah, yeah. I Those don't even do have a problem. Well. With it. It's not for me, but I think it's a totally. Oh, even valid, then, I'm like, I'd, I'd like Horizon Zero Dawn. Like, like sometimes it is for me. I like miniatures in games. Well, I see. Are, I don't are... even think Horizon Zero Dawn. I, like, I'm thinking more of the cool mini or not, where you get like 600 miniatures and and you know that that sort of thing. Horizon Zero Dawn to me isn't as as much of a, a miniature overblown overproduced sort of oh, thing as some know. once once you add in all the expansions and the stack that goes 12 feet high <laughs> if you backed everything i think yeah, it does fair. i fair. don't think the retail version goes there but i think the kickstarter might have fair yeah i don't know other changes in the industry the fantastic yet not complete way it has become shockingly more diverse in the last five years like, still like, not it, diverse it, enough but no, that's what I said. Definitely it's, it's, seen massive it's not there, but it has gotten so much better. Um, I, 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 the industry now better represents the people who buy the games because something Deanna pointed out that was a fantastic point. And I wish I took more pictures is the barbershop bar last Saturday is not what the average person thinks when you think who's at a board game night. There was so much diversity in that building playing games that does not match the the common conception of, of who a gamer is. And that was so awesome to see. And we're starting to see that starting to spread into the industry. Because for years, yes, a diverse group of people were playing the games, but a diverse group of people weren't the ones making the games. And it's great to see that expand. And yes, as Sean said, it's not there yet. I don't know if it'll ever be there, but I love seeing the progress that's been made. Absolutely. And even just little things like, you know, going to a con, I, I used to work a lot of conventions, not board game conventions, but just conventions of all sorts generally for my job. And one of the huge uh, changes that has happened in the world is something simple, but that means a lot. And that's the lack of booth babes. Uh, for people yeah. who don't know, maybe who are a little younger, the concept of booth babes was literally you would hire models, escorts, or someone to dress up nice and sexy in your booth to draw people in. Mm -hmm. They weren't employed by the company other than for that booth. They were just literally eye candy to draw people into your booth. Uh, and it was repulsive, and it was misogynistic, and it has been banned by most organizations, thankfully. 
Uh, but not seeing that around and seeing the diverse groups of people who are in the booths who are there because they love the games and they want to support the games mm. and sell you the games is just fantastic to see. Yeah. Um, another one uh, that will be near and dear to people in the chat room, one in particular, is accessibility in games. Knowing that red and green should not be in the same choice for player colors, knowing that your resources shouldn't all be the exact same size cubes with the exact same weight, uh, knowing that the font size of your rule book matters. Um, there, they, there's definitely some room to grow on that. There's still a little bit of room there. <laughs> um, I, and putting out dual layer player boards, not just because they hold stuff in place beat when a game gets bumped, um, including accessibility things like braille on games yeah. all right well let's kind of jump back to jeff and uh his next question was what games are there that you wish you could review but some reason can't justify whether they aren't available they're hard to review can't get anyone to play it with is there anything out there that you want to review but just can't or 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 haven't been able to or haven't figured out how to all right, big, big category of gaming. Um, I am looking at four shelves full of role-playing games right now to my, my left. Or, that's my right. <laughs> to, to my right. Four shelves of RPGs. Um, we talk about the pile of shame for board games. I don't even want to consider. Um, I did the math the other day. This is kind of impressive. For the pile of shame and obligation, I have not played 6% of the board games I have. That's not bad compared to many people. I don't even want to know. RPGs, I probably haven't played 80% or more of the ones I own. And worse, that's just physical books. Um, get into PDFs and <laughs> you can't go over 100, but like it, you might as well say I've never played an RPG in my life <laughs> if I compare how many of my PDFs I played compared to how many. I, we just, the, it, I used to say we don't have the group. But I could probably put together a group. I just don't have the time. Um, which gets back to how has my gaming changed? Our work-life balance right now is terrible. Yes, some of the work is playing games and, and socializing. So that part's nice. But, like, we work ridiculous hours. I can't see setting aside four hours a week to do anything right now without something else falling behind. So role-playing games. Role-playing games is, is the biggest. I would love to play more role-playing games and be able to talk about role-playing games and review role-playing games. Yeah, I would, I would love to do uh, and again, the big I think the big thing is Moe's uh, has adore adoration of in-person RPG. Uh, yeah. and I, I respect that. But at the same time, the world has shifted more towards online RPG groups. Um, and, and there, there's definitely a, a potential. And the other, the other thing is your, your prep, you, you tend to play RPGs that involve significant prep as opposed to masks yep. where you can sit down and all right, uh, where were we? All right. Okay. Let's, let's go. Um, and so between those two things, it makes it that much harder mm. to RPG. You know, if we were to sit down yep. on some, um, you know, at roll at dot app or something and play, a pbta game for four hours on a sunday night we could probably pull that off but that's not the kind of rpg that most interests mo um yeah. you would probably like, play that rather than actually uh possibly yeah. um than than D dm it maybe i should be running masks for a group <laughs> um, the problem is if i i if i sat at a computer playing a role-playing game i would feel like i'm i'm neglecting work right which is why i don't play video games on my pc is I'm sitting there thinking I could be on Amazon looking up what the latest deals are, and I could be sharing a tweet right now, or I could be working on the show notes, or, man, I haven't written an article on the blog in way too long. There's something I'm going to do better this year. I am going to actually publish articles on the blog, not just reviews. That is, that is something I need to do, and I am yet still haven't found the time. And I keep saying, you know, when the when the uh, the the uh swimming lessons are done then i'll have time it's, that's why i keep saying right when this is done i'll have time and i never do but i do have to get to that um all right well we got uh, i got one more question from the discord and this is from pax and this one is interesting because there's, there's a huge divergence here between mo and i on this one uh and i laughed as soon as as soon as i read the question 
So who are some of your content creator inspirations? Who do you look okay. up to and what That's podcasts or YouTube channels are at the top of your list? Ah, uh, so the, the big ones for me, um, the Dice Tower. Uh, the main reason for the Dice Tower, it's, it's not even what I love about the Dice Tower now compared to what it used to be is it's not just Tom. I personally have a huge amount of respect for Tom. I generally agree with what he says about games. While we don't have the same taste in games, one of the things Tom is good at is saying what he doesn't like and why it didn't work for him. And I can use his reviews to know enough about a game to know if it'd be for me or not. So I appreciate that. What I like more about the Dice Tower is how diverse everyone is and the fact they cover everything. So I can find out something about pretty much every game published every year through the Dice Tower somehow, through one of the members. And for the popular games, I can get two to ten different people's opinions, all from one source. So I greatly appreciate that. Next up would be the Secret Cabal, because they're just too damn fun to listen to. Listening to that show, you feel like you're part of the group. That's their whole thing. The Secret Cabal, they're the founders. They founded this private club of gamers who talk about games. And they have such a easygoing vibe that I like listening to that show. Plus, their hype is uh, their hype level. They're, they're jumping out of their pants, to use one of their terms. Gets you hyped about games. So they're really up there. Next would be the shows about making games, specifically Ludology. Now, that one's hit or miss for me because they keep changing hosts and they're changing who's talking about games, but they are fantastic for learning about the ins and outs and the insider information. So those are my probably my three biggest inspirations. As for doing the podcast, it was more the Dice Tower and a RPG podcast called Oh, it's been so long. Happy Jacks. The Happy Jacks RPG podcast was the direct inspiration for the Tabletop Bellhop answering your gaming game night questions. The Dear Abby for Gamers part that is a key to our show. They are a Dear Abby for RPGs. They are a Q&A show where every episode, two to three emails they read off and they discuss as a group. I wanted us to be that. I wanted to be the Happy Jacks for board games, but it just never worked out. The questions we get are very succinct. Hey, give me some games to do this, or hey, I'm having this game night problem. They're just not the get a bunch of people sit around a table and discuss it for an hour kind of questions. And I think that's just the nature of RPGs versus board games. So that is a huge inspiration for us is the Happy Jacks RPG podcast which I'll fully admit I don't listen to anymore because I'm not reviewing RPGs. I'm not playing RPGs and hearing talk about, you know, how do I fit this character into my game when I'm not playing RPGs just isn't as interesting. So those are probably the big ones, but there are so many more. Uh, the Misdirected Mark podcast the, 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 that I loved for RPG background. Gaming and BS, which I still miss. Uh, Sean and Brett had such a great back and forth. Those, that's another one. Um, there was Across the Board was one I really enjoyed as a board gaming podcast. I don't even know if they're still around. Uh, I, like I said, the main ones I still kind of keep up with are Secret Ball and Dice Tower because they kind of cover everything. Like To me, it feels like I need to listen to those to have any clue what's going on in the industry. So interestingly, unlike Mo, I don't listen to any gaming podcast. Uh, none. Uh, I, I, I have, on occasion, listened to Misdirected Mark. Uh, and I did drop in and listen to Sean and Brett's show while they were recording because I liked those people. Uh, yeah. But those were RPG podcasts and, and really not essentially at all <laughs> applicable to us. Um, my two biggest inspirations for what this show and my imagination of, of where we were going and what we were doing and what I wanted to do uh, were Smodcast with Kevin Smith and Scott Mosier. Um, mm -hmm. that was kind of my original focus of, you know, two friends talking about stuff. Uh, Kevin and Smith talk, Kevin and Scott talk about movies, games was going to be our sort of thing. Um, and then for a more, uh, sort of technical side, uh, security now with Leo Laporte and Steve Gibson on the Twit, uh, um, the Twit network, it was really my kind of, of once, once we, we had settled into that sort of host and, and expert um balance that we that we found uh and, and as much as that has shifted a little bit nowadays um yeah. 
that's that's sort of where it 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 originated from was that you know I'm going to be hosting the expert the tabletop bellhop Motisigno uh and that balance is something that Leo and Steve do really well in security now and I freely admit that if we do go ahead with the next changes I'm stealing it from that shows <laughs> format uh video format um and then with YouTube, uh, I tend to watch more uh, entertaining stuff or, you know, dude out in the field doing stuff, uh, right. which has nothing at all to do with what we do. So yeah. um, that's uh, that's completely different. All right. For for video, I didn't I, I, I missed the YouTube channel part of the question. Uh, Rodney Smith, watch it played. I, the the best board game teacher out there. Uh, Paul Grogan's Gaming Rules, also really good. Sorry, Paul. Rodney's just a bit above. I think it's mainly because he's Canadian. Um uh and um sorry mental break there where where was uh, rodney teaching videos what am i thinking of there's another one i also like to watch heavy, on heavy, youtube heavy cardboard no no not nothing against heavy cardboard <laughs> i don't watch them on youtube at all um oh i i had it and it's gone i'm i'm sorry it's completely gone who else do i watch on youtube Anyway, uh, the, the watch it plays are are the big ones I, that I I tend to do the, the the how to learn how to play games. A uh, dice tower, obviously. Um, what I like to watch is like dice tower now, which gives you a heads up. I used to adore board game breakfast, but I don't even know if they still do that. That was a bunch of short segments from a bunch of different people that used to be really good. Um, man, I I'm trying to think of where I was going. Sorry that I lost it. Those are, oh um, shut up and sit down. Because they're just entertaining and informative. Shut up and sit down. Like I, I, I want to be that show, but it's not us. Like we're just not that funny or entertaining or self defeating enough. Like it just, it's a type of comedy that I can't possibly recreate. It's just not in in me to do. I greatly enjoy watching shut up and sit downs videos. That's the one I'd lost. Fair enough. Uh, have you got your notes open for this next section? No. You uh, told me I didn't need oh, them, so okay. I got rid of them. I was going to talk about more games that that we I want to review we had, and I only got to the RPG part. Sure. So I'm going to jump back to Jeff's here to get into stuff uh, that we can't review and bring up the big one, Aventuria. We need to play more Aventuria, and it needs to be readily available for people to purchase. Uh, the fact it's available on the F shop on Ulysses Spiel just isn't enough. Why is this game not in like mass distribution. Why can't I get it at cool stuff or game nerds or 401 games? I would love to be talking about Aventuria every other week because I have enough content to talk about Aventuria, but I hate talking about it because I just get tons of messages. Of, Where can I get it? Where can I get it? Where can I get it? Yeah. All right. I will grab the show notes here. So <laughs> what do we had? Uh, okay. This is another one from our discord. Uh, I, you could have read this one off. Oh, okay. Um, this is from Pax the Paladin. Uh, one of our biggest fans. Pax hasn't been around. That is Pax in the last year. I think it's longer than that. Uh, out of nowhere, love Pax. I brought up uh, about Sean and his role in the show. And this is the reason I don't know if your whole quit <laughs> style is even going to work anymore because I don't feel that's what our show is anymore. But one of the things that has really developed over the life of the show that they've noticed is how Sean's voice has become more prominent, not just hosting, but commenting on the talk topics as an authoritative voice. I think it's a great thing. Well, Pax does. I, it's not that I don't. <laughs> Sorry. Who doesn't? Pax like, wait, does. that came out weird. <laughs> I think it's terrible. Sean should just be quizzing me. I, it's my show, not his. Uh, anyway, uh, what Pax loves is the difference in perspectives and experiences between us. And I, and I don't know. I feel like we're losing something in a way that we just it's becoming more homogenous. And you're knowing as much about games as I do. It is. But it's just moving away from our initial goal. Like, I'm like, I want you to enjoy these games as much as me. It's not like I'm like, no, Sean doesn't get to go and come to game nights. We can't talk about this in front of Sean so we can actually ask legit questions once the show gets going. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, again, the initial concept was to have me, a normal, talking to Mo, who's a gamer. Uh, but it's hard not to get more gaming under my belt as we go on and do this. And it's interesting, you know, I was talking about YouTube channels that I watch, and one of them I watch is uh, a uh, food channel from the UK called Sorted. And the initial okay. concept of Sorted was professional chefs who are friends with normals 
uh, and they work together in the kitchen. Well, they've been doing it now for about five or six years. And now these normals are, while not trained chefs, far more chefy than anyone right. who could ever call themselves a normal. And so while they still do chefs and normals, it has evolved much in the same way ours has just by the fact that these normals are constantly uh, surrounded by the chefy world and chefy ingredients and ways of cooking and things like that. And I think really that's what's happened to me is I, I can't continue being a quote unquote normal around all of this gaming content. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I also do, and I started this a, a lot in part because I wasn't yet in Windsor, is while I may not have been able to play the games, um, I love just going out and reading comments and posts, digging through Reddit, mm -hmm. going through the comments on Board Game Geek, which I really don't recommend any normal human do. Um, <laughs> again, the comments in places like that are full of hate and vitriol and, and disgust as much as any comment anywhere. But yeah. being able to put up with that, you can distill out and, and, and push aside some of the disgust and get some real nuggets of truth. So, you know, again, you know, turn, turn the volume all the way down on the hate. And, and there's some real honest opinions that come in there once you, you've distilled it out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I find that, 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 that has been to me an interesting thing that I have been able to bring, uh, about the sort of the public view on games, uh, simply by being able to put up with their crap. <laughs> yeah. I don't tend to go like I, I listen to some gaming podcasts and I get some of their views and I, I follow a lot of content creators on social media. So sometimes get to hear their impressions, but, uh, I try not to like. Before I review a game, listen to a bunch of other people's reviews or go on board game geek to see what people said. I would rather form my own opinion because I don't want to bias. I don't want to sit there and start playing the game and be like, but I know this one strategy is broken. Like, I, I just don't want to do that. I want it to be a fresh view. Now, I used to feel that way about our unboxing videos, but we shifted that. It used to be our unboxings. I wanted you to see the surprise of me opening it. Um, but now I actually do some research before doing the unboxing so that I don't call up pawn a die. Um, as, as an example, we were shown at Origins. Well, we, and we had a number of, of sort of, you know, people, again, this is, you know, people in the comments who were, you know, calling us out. Uh, and I don't think correctly, but it didn't take a lot of effort to make some of that, uh, some of those changes uh, and learn about it in, in an upfront so I think it, it can make some, you lose some of the natural um, interest and surprise and some of that natural reaction, but yeah. it does lead to a little bit better of an informational uh, tool, yeah. which is really what we're using it for anyway. Now, what we have started to do is uh, trying to record me opening up the boxes as a like better quality video than me sitting at the end of a podcast trying to hold stuff up at the camera while Sean's using up half the screen. Um, so that's where we're hoping to get that surprise that, oh my God, look at this. Oh, look how cool it is. So we are, we are trying to do that um, as, as something to keep some of that uh, joy of opening something new versus, oh, this is this token that is for this. All right, well, we got one more thing and Brian brought this up early on in our ask. And I think it's a great way to kind of wrap up this uh, this question session, this informative five year hangout, and that is, okay. where do you see yourself in the next five years of creating quality hobby board game content? And thank you, Ryan, for considering it quality hobby board gaming content <laughs> for, already. I I honestly I don't expect things to be all that different. Um, the my hope is that we have reached a place, um, a better work life balance, the a, a better I am playing some of the games on my shelves. We are playing RPGs. It's not just racing to get the the five plays in so we can review something before the Kickstarter ends. Uh, the more of a more of a flow and balance to everything. Uh, we had that in the beginning, and somewhere in between it got lost. I think we tried to do too much too quick, and, and too much in one week. And maybe we're doing it again, trying to fit in three reviews some episodes. I, I want to find that balance. The other thing is to make it more financially viable so we're not scrambling. Some months are tighter than others. So far, we're making this work. 
but with current inflation, increase in grocery prices and so on, it's getting harder and harder. And unfortunately, the like the affiliate links aren't keeping up with the rate of inflation. <laughs> I have to go on strike and, and demand a better wage. Um, so in five years, I hope to, for one, be able to keep doing this as a living, do this full time. Uh, hopefully living a little more comfortable at the same time with a little more, you know, spending money, ability to go to more cons during the year. And also to have a little better work balance, work life balance, so that we're not constantly doing something for the bellhop every waking moment and killing an hour every night on the TV. And that's all we do every day. For me, I just want to sort of keep in, uh, increasing our production quality, uh, you know, slow and slow and steady. Uh, you know, every every little bit counts. We've got a new camera for Mo and uh, we've got a new new using Teams now instead of Zooms and little step by step. We've been improving things and finding new ways to do things. Uh, and I just hope to continue that and uh, see where we go from there. So that's it for our five year birthday hangout. Thank you, everyone who joined us here live. And thank you so much for the great questions. If you do have a question for us, that is what we're here for. Again, our goal is to be a Dear Abby for gamers. We want you to ask us your game night problems. Um, send in game recommendations, uh, problems you're having, how to plan an event. Um, send it in in a, you know, sleepless in Seattle. I have difficulty learning games. What's the best way? for me to sit down and learn to play games before my friends come over. So we're prepared to that kind of thing. We would love some nice long form questions. Those can be sent to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Or if you don't want to send an email and give us your email address, not that we're going to do anything with it. You could also head to the tabletop bellhop webpage at tabletopbellhop.com and click on ask the bellhop. That'll give you a form to fill out. And you can put a fake email address in there. We're not going to check. <laughs>